Good morning. Uh, welcome to the last session of this conference. It's gone by so fast, but I think you've picked a good one as your last one. My name is Steph Vasco. I'm the Senior Director of Communications at the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness. And to start, I just wanted to say um, our land acknowledgement here. Um, the city of Halifax is situated in the Mijimaji, the ancestral and traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq people. Today's session will look at innovative solutions to homelessness. Each presentation will have 20 minutes, and then we'll have about a half an hour Q&A time at the end. So get into it. <laughs> um, so the first presentation, uh, we'll look at uh, Upstream Kelowna. Um, and the, the presenters here are uh, Stephen Gates, Jackie Son, and Philly Putlitz. Uh, so I'll tell you a bit about each of them. Uh, Jackie Son is a senior researcher with the COH. She holds a PhD in educational policy from the University of Toronto. She's a senior researcher at COH, uh, adjunct professor at the University of British Columbia School of Social Work, and a research fellow at Carleton University. Prior to this, she worked in the Ontario Pub Public Service in a policy role. Currently, her research focuses on evidence-informed policy and cross-sector collaboration in working towards better educational outcomes and opportunities for youth. We also have Stephen Gates, President and CEO of the COH, Professor at York University and Scientific Director of Making the Shift. Stephen has had a long-standing interest in understanding homelessness, its causes, how it's experienced, and potential solutions. His program of research has been defined by his desire to make research matter through conducting and mobilizing rigorous scholarly research that contributes not only to our knowledge base on homelessness, but also to solutions to homelessness that impact on policy practice and public opinion. And finally, we have Philly Pulitz. She, uh, Philly is with the BGC Okanagan and is the upstream program coordinator in Kelowna, BC. She has a bachelor's of psychology, but attributes the wealth of her knowledge to her eight years of experience working with high-risk youth aged 13 to 25 in her community. Philly started her work with BGC Okanagan as a volunteer in 2013, facilitating writing workshops. Before long, she became the drop-in program coordinator where she coordinated life skills programming for young people, trained many youth workers and volunteers, and built strong community connections. Uh, in November 2020, Philippi Philly used her connections and expertise as the new upstream program coordinator to establish strong community relationships and implement Upstream Canada on a local level. You'll hear all about that soon. Thank you, everyone. Well, should use the microphone. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we'll uh, begin our presentation, mindful of the time here. Okay. Um, so here's the agenda, uh, what we're going to be covering. So we'll just set the set up like what is upstream? Why do why do we need something like upstream? Uh, and eventually we're going to get to practice lessons in the way forward. And it's important uh, to learn not just what are the outcomes of the intervention, but how do you set up something and make it work. So Upstream's an example where we had tried a number of pilot projects, none of which worked. So we were really good at not doing it well. And now we have an exemplary model in Kelowna which is fantastic and it's been working well. A lot of the things that we got stuck on in the past were removed, things like getting schools to participate, that kind of thing. So we're looking forward to hearing that part. Um, so in, I'll just do a, a quick overview of what we know about youth homelessness in Canada. Um, you know, there are about 35 to 40,000 young people experience homelessness uh, and that's people between the ages of uh, 13 and 24. Um, uh, the certain subpopulations are overrepresented, Indigenous youth, uh, LGBTQ2S, Black youth are all overrepresented. Um, one of the interesting things from our research, we've done two national studies with over 1,100 participants, is uh, when people first experience homelessness. And we found that 40% of currently homeless youth had their first experience before they were 16 years old. The characteristics of that group are very different than those who had their first experience at 16 or older, like much more adverse childhood experiences, 
uh, more likely to be involved in child protection, um, more likely to be bullied, more likely to have uh, a diagnosis of learning disability, these kinds of things. And the challenge in Canada is for that group of people, our homelessness systems do nothing. In some jurisdictions they do, but generally, and the data we collect starts at age 16. We're ignoring people who are in crisis and have very complex needs by not addressing them. So uh, and this will become relevant when we talk about why upstream. So, um, so yeah, here's basically this, it's an equity problem. Like who has access to support? And I, a key thing we believe is what we're not talking about is build more homeless shelters to throw young people in, you know, because it's just kind of like expanding the group home model, right? So, so what are we going to do about it? We have to think about addressing youth homelessness. Well, actually, I think all homelessness in uh, different ways than what we're kind of landing on right now. Um, we need to consider a systems approach. So that's not system integration, but how do we engage other public systems which may also be contributing to youth homelessness or adult homelessness in the solutions to homelessness. Because uh, homelessness is what we call a fusion policy issue. It's not just the homelessness sector that should be there. It, you know, every part of government pretty much has a stake or should have a stake in uh, addressing homelessness. Maybe the Ministry of Mining is not one, but for the most part. So what are we going to do? Um, we've done a lot of work talking with young people about their pathways in homelessness and where along that pathway did somebody know, a, a meaningful adult know that there was something wrong? And where would have been a point where help for the young person and or their family would have helped ensure they didn't become homeless? And young people are really clear, they know a lot about that. It's like, yeah, I had a teacher in, uh, you know, grade six, I, I was couch surfing at a friend's house and the teacher didn't know what to do or they said you should go to a shelter, that kind of thing. And, and so it, it points out that we need to like come up with solutions that are designed to work with young people and their families, keep them in place in their communities, uh, re resolve the issues, build better relationships where we can, uh, keep people safe, keep them attached to school, and uh, make sure they don't become homeless. And so, in North America, the prevention of homelessness has been, until recently, and I still argue it, it still mostly is an afterthought, right? It's not a high priority. But in Australia, going back to the 1990s when their modern mass homelessness began to emerge, the uh, thinking was, do we really want to build shelters for young people experiencing homelessness? Why don't we try preventing it? And so they have a long history of doing that. And one of the main successes is what's called, what was called the Geelong Project. They now call it Upstream Australia. And uh, they, what they did is they went into the schools, collaborated. So you, it wasn't like a school-based program in that the school was running it, but it was like community-based organizations with expertise in working with young people and families uh, would collaborate with the school. They'd go in and, uh, you know, do uh, assemblies with students to talk about homelessness. They talked to the staff, the teachers, uh, everyone, and then they developed this method of assessing young people and providing them with supports. And that's what we're going to talk about today is how this, how we, we didn't steal the idea from them because we told them we were going to use it, but <laughs> we did import it. Maybe that's the better word. So that's what we're going to talk about. Like this is a, an intervention that is showing such promise in terms of outcomes and we're learning a lot how to do it well. You can do it in any community. Any community that has a school, this can be added. And so we'll talk more about that as well. I think I went too long, but <laughs> there we go. Thanks, Steve. So the way it works upstream is that it appears straightforward. So it's a three-step process where students complete a standardized assessment, then they're offered an opportunity to participate in a validation interview, uh, and then offered wraparound supports uh, for those who'd like to, to accept. Uh, but there are, however, many complexities and challenges, especially because it works in relationship with schools. 
Uh, and the challenges include collaborating with two sectors that are unaccustomed to partnering together in a meaningful way. So traditionally, schools might serve as community hubs, the physical space uh, to provide a place for um, community initiatives or as a data source. And schools generally don't consider youth homelessness to be within their scope of practice. And it's, it's reflective of the way uh, public perception is um, misunderstanding the issue and not considering youth homelessness as even a problem at all. And so, um, you know, there's also risks associated with addressing this in schools. Unions are quite powerful uh, and there's a lot of uh, priorities, other priorities that educators have to contend with. So we have to be mindful of that as well. Uh, you know, there's risks like social welfare involvement and concerns around the early intervention piece. So ideally we would be uh, supporting students in schools between age 12 to 14. Uh, but, you know, districts want the the opt-in consent approach instead of the opt-out, which, which is what we're aiming for because that is what is actually inclusive and um, accessible for students. Uh, and also we have to consider the social services sector that's already overburdened with crises situations. So revealing risk uh, makes them accountable too uh, because more needs are revealed as a result. So we know there's a need. We understand that schools are one of the best places to, to reach uh, as at-risk youth, but then there's all these challenges as well. Um, for upstream, there's a need for adaptation because if we're taking a program from Australia, we don't just want to simply transplant a program here where there's a big need for contextual adaptation. And we know that that kind of an approach typically fails for social innovations. Uh, and so there's this tricky balance between fidelity and, and adaptation. The research on social innovation has been abstract with, with vague advice. Uh, so for example, collaboration and trust building, what does that actually mean and what does that look like? Especially when it comes to working with schools that are that are usually they have closed doors. And so how do we get in? Um, so based on my interdisciplinary background, um, I know that there are ways of, of borrowing from other disciplines like social science to um, contribute to conceptual shifts of people who you're not normally used to or accustomed to working with and, and who have different agendas. And so, um, you know, approaches like persuasion and framing, communications, aligning institutional um, priorities and norms and cultures is, is a great way to approach another sector. Uh, and I have so much gratitude for Steve, actually, because when I came on board to try to overhaul the model that had not been working, he provided so much space and time and, and trust in, in allowing me to dig deep in, into the research to develop a model that would hopefully set it up for success for the new round in Kelowna. So following this framework, as, as all of our projects do at the COH, um, it's important to do the work of understanding the issues uh, you know, involved, learning from other initiatives, including the ones that failed. Um, and we learn from literatures across disciplines, diving deep into the research evidence on what works and what doesn't, and then exploring these concepts and approaches with people on the ground and the intended beneficiaries. So our community partners, education uh, partners and people with lived experience to arrive at a place where a solid, collectively developed uh, evidence-based plan could be implemented. To sum up what we know then, the importance of prevention is, is obvious to us and the need to address it across the sectors. Um, it's, it's an access and equity issue and schools are an ideal place. So we drew on the fields of policy and implementation science, social work and education, as well as knowledge mobilization, which led to the development of this framework um, we knew persuasion tactics would be key to getting schools on board uh, towards meaningful collaboration, seeing schools as valuable partners and experts in their own right, uh, instead of telling them what to do. And for example, instead of seeing them as passive participants, uh, as active and, and critical contributors. So doing the hard work of planning to effectively leverage and honor the existing work of schools 
uh, that they're already doing. So understanding that educators are overwhelmed, making sure to emphasize that upstream is meant to alleviate social care burdens rather than adding to their work. Uh, and so the research told us that these approaches would set upstream up for success through building in the ownership and support needed for sustainability. So based on these foundational insights, we uh, landed on this model with equity at the center. Uh, you know, equity is a key priority for schools across Canada. So this, you know, would grab their attention. And this key priority resonates with the education sector. The alignment of institutional priorities is big in collaboration. So this focus is critical as well. And adaptation is also built into the model. As we know, community contacts are unique and bringing people on board who feel they have agency and value in developing a highly relevant plan is also key. Uh, so this model is not set in stone. Our philosophy and approach is that our work is fluid. It's open to emerging needs and understandings of best practice. So the model can evolve as researchers and, and practitioners continually engage to improve the model. So the result is that in Kelowna, um, you know, our, this great demonstration site embraced the role of research. Uh, they were open to conceptual and, and practice shifts as well, which was so key to all of this. And, uh, you know, there was this unusual process of long-term planning and relationship building and integrating research-informed approach. Um, so I really commend Philly and her team for, you know, throughout the uh, COVID pandemic, um, you know, collaborating through a computer screen or laptop screens. Uh, and there's been such a beauty in working through these challenges together. There's been openness uh, from researchers and practitioners alike uh, in learning and developing together. So that was such a great experience for me as well. And the outcome is significant. So in the first round of implementation, there was a 94% participation rate, which is unheard of. And I attribute that a lot in thanks to the team who did a lot of the hard work with the knowledge mobilization um, with the school district, school administrators, educators, and the students to raise awareness about youth homelessness and the importance of participation. Um, and also moving the district to waive the requirement to obtain parental consent. That was a, an his, historic um, approval. So uh, that was huge. Uh, and all of these elements work together. And so fast forward to 2022, 2023 outcomes, we can see Upstream Kelowna has helped so many youth. This is just a snapshot. And I'd like to highlight here that 60% of the students were under the radar of schools. So these were the silent sufferers that were getting A's. They, they were quiet. They, you know, the school didn't notice anything was wrong with them. Uh, and they were all supported through the upstream process. So we tend to think that risk is evident through behavior issues or low educational engagement. But these things usually come once crisis hits um, in, in some cases, as we can see, because it's been consistent throughout the rounds of implementation. It's always been about half of the students were under the radar. And that was staggering to the school admin and, and a big impetus for them to, to keep this going. So, um, you know, this also aligned, you can see to what we know that homelessness is an equity issue. There are consistently overrepresented groups among the students. So it's been remarkable, again, uh, to experience this community engaged research that has resulted in increasing access and, and witnessing how our community partners have been able to engage with schools as true partners in a sustainable way. Um, there's been great success through effective framing and communications, aligning sector and institutional priorities and the right approach to collaboration. And uh, what does that look like? Philly is going to illuminate uh, what that looks like on the ground. Thank you. So, okay, I do not have enough time, but that's okay. I gotta try and get this in presenter mode. Uh oh. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I could talk about this for ninety minutes, so let me do this in three. Um, yeah. So upstream Kelowna, I do like to introduce myself as Philly. I'm the upstream Kelowna coordinator. I'm technically employed with BGC Okanagan, and I say it that way because my job is to oversee. T 
to um, make sure that we are implementing up to the fidelity of the Upstream Canada model, as well as do on the ground work with a collaborative of youth and family serving agencies within our community. I'm not going to name them all here, although it's my absolute honor and job to name them all individually. And if I could, I'd name every single support person and steering representative and partner within our project by name as well. Um, we are six youth and family serving agencies partner directly with Central Okanagan Public Schools. We work hand in hand with them in their schools. We connect on a daily basis, whether it's on the telephone, whether it's in person, whether it's over Zoom. We collaborate, we strategize, we problem solve together through everything. This is a little bit of a really up-to-date impact um, overview. So we are currently actually undergoing our sixth student needs assessment. At, uh, our, we have two participating middle schools right now in Kelowna. We've got eight middle schools overall. Our aim is to be in all eight middle schools in the next five years. We're onboarding our third middle school for the first time since we launched our project in 2021 this year. This has been our most seamless implementation of the student needs assessment to date, and that is a testament to the work that we have been doing over the years and the seamless strategizing that we've been doing, the like overcoming of hurdles and like full abrupt stops and U-turns that we've had to make to go back to the drawing board. So we're really, really excited. And a lot of that really is the relationships that we've built with our educators and our leadership teams at the schools who've come forward with creative solutions that they have thought of that we could never have thought of on our own, where they've indicated, hey, by the way, when our kids are in PE block, we have four rotating empty classrooms. Do you think you could use those? Yes. So we currently, we had planned two and a half weeks to complete our check-ins. This is what uh, Jackie referred to as the validation interviews. It's just one example of how we've reframed some of the language into some more upstream preventative type vocabulary. So we've under, we are undergoing check-ins with 96 young people at in grade eight. Um, and we're about halfway through. And yet again, we've got about 60% currently that have signed on for support that are flying under the radar. So that is very, very consistent. One implementation after the next, actually, we do have that 91% response rate accumulating that like average from the beginning of our first assessment. 40% um, of those kiddos will be flagged by our analysis, by our research team at COH. And then 40% of those kiddos will sign on for support and time and time again, 50% are flying under the radar. I would love to talk about all the different types of supports and services that we offer. We do look at every realm of uh, well-being that could possibly add to their protective factors to prevent youth homelessness and school disengagement from ever happening. Um, I think what's really, really important here is that when we're talking to our parents, to our students, and to our educators, what we really like to emphasize is the fact that every single student deserves a safe space, deserves someone to talk to, deserves an opportunity to feel safe enough to talk about the things that they would never talk about. This work makes me emotional. <laughs> And I don't have enough time because I've worked with over 700 youth and families that have already experienced abandonment, street entrenchment, homelessness, loss of loved ones, complex addiction crisis. And I finally get to work on the other side of things and I finally get to stop the revolving door and turn that freaking tap off. Right. And so Sarah McKinnon, when she discovered Upstream Canada pre being presented at a conference and brought it to us in 2018, it was her and Jamie Lloyd Smith, now a part of the municipality. Right. I had to do a name drop in Penticton, went to our health promoting schools community uh, committee and went to our board of education and they went to our community and they presented the evidence that was created by the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness and the wonderful research team that I have beside me here that laid the foundation to just say, look, can we think about what's possible? Can we define the this need is absolutely there. And then when they had to trust us enough that we were going to work alongside them and rebuild this like skeleton, which is what we made Upstream Canada into, like <laughs> from the ground up, we had to readapt every single individual phase of the project from the ground up to make sense for the context and complex needs and situations from our youth and family serving agencies, from our demographics and for our schools. And they've stuck with us and they've been absolute champions. That's basically what I just spoke to. Every single picture here has a story and it's not a stockpile picture. We do incredible things. We don't work out of an office, not just in the schools or in our own office buildings. We are everywhere. These are some of the different phases of the project and I've only got, do I have two seconds? Please ask me a lot of questions. <laughs> Pull me aside at the end of your conference and talk to me because I would love to talk to you.
We're currently. I'm going to talk about what's next. We're just waiting for the Board of Education to select our final school. But just so you know, I already kind of know who it's going to be. And I've already planted the seeds of relationship building. So <laughs> thanks. Thank you so much, Upstream team and Philly. Yes, please ask her lots of questions. I know she's excited to talk to you all about it. We can feel it. <laughs> uh, next up, we have Cheryl Forchuk. Cheryl is the Beryl and Richard Ivy Research Chair in Aging, Mental Health, Rehabilitation, and Recovery, a distinguished university professor at Arthur Labatt Family School of Nursing at Western University, and a scientist and assistant director at Lawson Health Research Institute. All right. So we'll just got to get to the right PowerPoint. There we go. <laughs> yeah, apparently some people won't. Okay. No? Okay. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to be talking to you about a secondary analysis uh, that we did on our national study where the overall uh, purpose of the study was not to look at the, the impact of the pandemic because we designed the study to go uh, across the country before the pandemic, uh, surprise. Uh, but we ended up going to every province and territory during the pandemic, and um, which was not easy. And it was kind of hard to not notice. We ended up pulling out some specific uh, issues that we were witnessing and seeing. I will also say, uh, that uh, a good part of what we're talking about today is also in a recent uh, publication of the International Journal of Homelessness. Abe, the editor, who's also coincidentally from the School of Nursing at Western, uh, is here. And I'm sure if you also have really good ideas for publishing like this, uh, you should go talk to Abe to get some of that uh, work, work published. So nothing to disclose other than... I. Uh, um, uh, and, and so these are some of the things. I just wanted to talk about some of these um, changes that occurred so we can reflect back on that in that. And to think as well, there was both drawbacks and benefits. And people may say, well, I'm done. I, I don't want to even think about the pandemic anymore. But um, this, th th I, I think it's also important to look at, this is probably not the last pandemic we're going to see. It's probably not the last crisis we're going to see. Uh, so it is important to reflect on uh, on those those learnings. Uh, this our primary um, funder for the project uh, is the government of Ontario, both the Public Health Agency of Canada and Reaching Home, uh, and the um, we I, I think many of us uh, experience what what the changes. Uh, are that we we had there, and again, the main study was actually to find a better way to calculate how many people in Canada were homeless, and to also engage both people providing frontline service and uh, people with lived experience, because we had developed an algorithm to use on health data uh, in Ontario that was working extremely well. We can tell get provincial level data uh, that suggests we could probably triple the numbers from the conventional means of calculating. But we needed to go to the different provinces, to territories, to see what were the contextual issues, whether or not it would make sense uh, to broaden it. Uh, so we know during the pandemic, we had things like decreased shelter capacity, personal hygiene areas were compromised. Um, but we did have access to hotel spaces. Uh, which was something different. Uh, and I know, for example, in London, where I work, we had so many people that were temporarily in a hotel that went from there to housing uh, because they had that period of, of stability. So in some ways that, depending on how the communities used it, and we saw huge variation there, um, but, but many communities actually took great advantage. We had other communities that put people in a hotel room and disconnected the phone. So, so, so there was a range in terms of how people really took advantage of that. Uh, also, the, the visibility of encampments. We've, all, we've had encampments for a long time, but not with this visibility. Um, and then, again, all the at-risk groups were further compromised uh, dur during the uh, pandemic. I'm, I'm, the other thing I should say, um, I, 
uh, if I run out of the room at the end, it's got nothing to do with with what Shay says last or the last question. I had previously booked a, hold, um, a, a taxi to pick me up at 11.30. And I told him as soon as I finish, I'm running out. And then this got delayed by 15 minutes. So it, my, my exiting will have nothing to do with what was just said. Um, so, so again, we had, um, we had 28 communities across the country that we were involved with, that we visited, that we did focus groups with and individual interviews, uh, every province and territory, large places, small places. So um, one, one of, and again, one of our things is we feel that there's very much an urban bias uh, in homeless studies, homeless, and so that we, we felt it was important to get to some of the communities that only had a thousand people, for example, uh, and also understand that. So I'm focusing today on the service providers uh, that part, uh, of which we had 200 participate in focus groups from these 28 communities. Um, and um, we, we really worked with people locally um, to, and, and CAEH was also a, a big uh, help uh, to find people, uh, find a key person that would uh, that would be our contact person, send out invitations. We often attended virtually uh, various meetings to get people. Uh, so the, the, this is just a sub-analysis uh, of what's going on um, in terms of the, the virus hitting, created a number of system changes that overall made things worse, but, but there were some opportunities and some things that got better. Uh, it's just that, that in terms of that balance, it, it, it went on the worst side. Uh, and so I'll be uh, going through uh, th these things in more detail, uh, but the system changes, the personal life changes, this idea of previous strategies not working, the opportunities, something's getting better in this overall. So I'm just gonna go into uh, these in more detail. And these are the, the, the areas I'll be talking about. So one, one of the things that we certainly found uh, during the pandemic that with that increased cost in housing, which actually was preceding the pandemic. People often think that was a direct result of the pandemic. It was made way worse uh, by the pandemic, but it had actually started uh, a bit before. Uh, but at, at the time, people were primarily talking about issues like home ownership. It took a while for it to trickle down people saying it's also affecting rent. Um, the other thing that uh, that was happening with that is, of course, with virtual work, people were moving out to these smaller rural communities. And so the, it, it really spread uh, where, where that was happening. So uh, we, we found a lot of people, uh, it, it, we, both from the focus groups and the staff talked about it, but also uh, when we were talking to the 400 people we interviewed, uh, people ended up in a lot of unsafe situations, unfaith, and these are just examples, like the basements with mold, vehicles, outdoors, homes where uh, there was domestic violence, but they, they were unable to get somewhere else. Um, and just the lack of housing and the long waiting list. So all these things really got worse, but it was very much uh, related uh, to this lower availability. The other thing we really heard about uh, related to that uh, was the whole issue of rent evictions was was huge things being sold at a profit, uh, converted into Airbnbs, things being converted uh, like group homes, for example, being converted into residential properties so they could be sold at a profit. One of the communities we went to lost six group homes, uh, and we interviewed some people that had been in a group home for a decade and ended up on the street. Uh, and, but we found that in multiple uh, communities. And we don't think of things such as a private landlord with a group home as a community good. So we don't have, the, we don't have those things in mind. We, we, we have this vision that everything's a personal good and you can do with it as you wish. Uh, but when, when these profit motives became so strong, we lost a lot. Um, the adoption of virtual care was very interesting. Uh, in that I've actually worked in looking at mental health care and what we could do uh, to support people using some newer technology for years. Uh, and actually think in many ways that can be a good thing. But when we, and we, we have had many 
good things like using your phone to support memory, um, for example, to get prompts, reminders. But when we did those studies, we gave them a phone and a data plan. And in some of those communities, they also gave them a phone in a data plan uh, in terms of people experiencing homelessness, but most of them did not. So things went virtual overnight without the access um, to, and, and even with the Wi-Fi uh, issues, like people that had normally access libraries or Tim Hortons, suddenly these things were not, so they might have a phone, but no data plan. And, and now there was no Wi-Fi, but all the services were moving. Uh, and again, think about some of the specific subpopulations um, that may not feel as comfortable with virtual care and, and where trust, in any, any group where trust is a huge issue in the system. Um, it's, it, it, now, um, we have had, in terms of, in London, some of our previous work with virtual care, so in therapeutic relationships can certainly be developed virtually. Um, and in, in fact, sometimes it's easier because people aren't wasting time driving from a, from a distance where they're worried about the drive home, they can actually engage in the moment. Um, but I think, again, this idea of trust was not built in to these changes in the system, the time it takes to establish trust. Um, so increasing, we've, we had funds, uh, ability to hire. Um, it illuminated research gaps, uh, such as not connecting with the hidden homelessness some of the, the negative things related to data collection, most places stopped or delayed things such as the PIP counts. Um, the partners were dropping out of research and data initiatives simply due to lack of capacity. I, I know I had some partners I've worked with for 20 years and it's sort of like, can we just sit back for this one? Um, like we're, we're, we're up to our eyeballs right now. But for, fortunately, most were still able to continue. Um, delayed construction of new shelters, additional funding was insufficient. Um, and the, um, as I say, the hotels and quarantine shelters had both positive and negative, depending on how the communities took advantage or didn't take advantage. Um, so, you know, some of the people, for example, even uh, would put people using substances on the first floor so they could have a harm reduction thing. They, they could be alerted and observe people in, ter in terms of uh, preventing crisis. As I say, get, get them their missing um, health cards and things like that while they're in a period of stability. And as I say, other communities cut the phone and just left people there and couldn't figure out why they wouldn't stay put. Um, so overworked and understaffed agencies, we saw this so much for any anyone that was an essential worker at this point. And I'll say, we got into all these places as essential workers. We had to apply uh, to get in as essential workers, which sometimes was a seven page form, um, especially in some of the territories. And then we had to get a further exemption to not be, to not be quarantined for two weeks. Uh, and which meant we had to agree to a lot of testing. I, I've been personally tested. Uh, over 200 times and then stop counting. Um, and that was a lot of PCR tests, not just the, the rapid test. I always say I gave my nose for this study. Um, and all negative and, and all, everyone on my team, uh, nobody, uh, because we we've had hospital level uh, uh, pr procedures uh, in terms of what we were using. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know about the rest, the vacant jobs, the, the resignations. Uh, the the financial struggles, job loss, et cetera, these ev evictions, which as I say, were often rent evictions to get around some of the legislation. People just generally deteriorating in terms of mental health and increased substance use. One study I find people are not paid enough attention to that I think is gonna, uh, we're, we're gonna see for a long time. There was a large data set study in the US um, that looked, because COVID causes inflammation of every major body system, right, including the brain. Uh, and this one large data set that had tens of thousands of people and it found that post-COVID, they found 20% developed a major mental illness within six months. We're not, can you imagine where our mental health system is now? Are we prepared for that? That's usually considered the lifetime prevalence. Uh, what, what's going to happen in five years, six years? We, and so we have not uh, accommodated those changes. Um, we know that, pre, that often there, there's um, migratory patterns, particularly in our 
uh, more northern communities and in our more rural communities. And a lot of businesses count on that. They count on the agricultural help, hunting season, fishing season. So this became very um, uh, interrupted in those smaller and rural and remote communities. People got stuck in the wrong place and couldn't get home. Uh, and people that had been surviving by couch surfing, people weren't comfortable because of the, the isolation rules. And again, we already talked about um, the, you know, the intimate partner violence issues. Uh, so the, again, opportunities, new housing opportunities, protecting people, enhancing services, uh, providing communication to, to devices for people experiencing homelessness done in several communities was great. The other thing to, we saw in several communities was citizen-led initiatives. I call it the YIMBYism. Uh, and it's never, it has not overtaken NIMBYism, not in my backyard, the yes in my backyard. But I have not in my life seen as much YIMBYism as what I saw uh, during the pandemic. The first time this one thing happened, I thought, oh, I must be hearing this wrong. And they, it was a group, they were getting together from the neighborhood, they had a face group book discussion weekly on Wednesday. Or anything with parents. So you mentioned parents as part of the, as part of the, information or and it, do they have to consent? Do you ever get pushback? Because maybe some families don't want sort of, yeah, there's stuff coming out basically. Again, like I can answer this in another 20 minutes too, so I'll try to keep it short. Um, we get that question a lot and I appreciate the question. So I should mention the fact that Upstream works with the child and with the entire family. So we also take our family and natural supports framework that's integrated into everything that we do. Um, we have the opt-out um, waivers or uh, consent method, right? So we are required to inform parents that the student needs assessment is happening in schools. We've actually gone a step above and said, we're not only going to uh, inform them beforehand with a newsletter, but we're also going to inform them afterwards and give them a heads up that we're now doing our check-ins, so our validation interviews. We also meet with the Parent Advisory Council every year and give them an orientation to upstream and provide an update on our impact. We meet with parents at parent barbecues. We make ourselves available through giving our contact to the school leadership team, the counseling team, and the educators so that they can contact us at any time. We've created Kelowna, or upstream Kelowna brochures that we bring in to the parent advisory councils, uh, the barbecues, teacher orientations. We bring them into the student needs assessment facilitation, our implementation day, so that kids can bring those brochures home to parents. They have my direct contact information. They can contact me at any time. We also then hand them out at the check-in interviews. They have another opportunity. If a kiddo signs on for support, we immediately call the parents with consent from the kid and introduce them to who we are and what we do and why we do our work and immediately extend our support services to the family if they need it as well. Typically, we end up doing that once relationship is built. Oftentimes, parents come back to us saying, you know what, this is exactly what I needed when I was a kid. Thank you. Um, we've had one to five parents that have come back saying, I'm my kiddo's like knight in shining armor. What are you doing? Are you telling me I'm not good enough? And it really is like a three minute conversation of just validating and letting the parent be heard and letting them know you just don't need to do it alone if you choose not to. Um, and then now, now that we're a couple years in, we can really give examples of the different ways that we've been able to support families, increase their, um, it, their, co their cohesion, their relationship, their ability to communicate, how we've been able to facilitate um, meaningful conversation and um, experiences of children that, went, that are just, that may love and feel cared for by their parents, but just need one other parent or adult that they can trust, that they can feel safe opening up to. A lot of the kiddos that we work with don't want to put more on their parents. And that's one of the reasons why their risk factors or what we call barriers to resilience are going unnoticed. Does that answer your question? <laughs> What's that? What do you and your staff eat for breakfast? Today I had two venti Starbucks coffees, each with an extra shot of espresso. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm with the COH, and um, those were great presentations, and not just because some of them are my colleagues, but <laughs> of course, because you know uh, this is a much needed uh, data inform and research uh, you know body of research that could potentially be groundbreaking in terms of shifting the public discourse to preventive 
focus and equity conscious approach to, to youth homelessness. So with that in mind, um, so my question is for the upstream team, uh, spe specifically regarding the research design. And I wonder in terms of, um, you know, is there like a possibility of, uh, you know, keeping track of those participants, in this case students, who entered the program and were assessed using SNA over time? Like when they entered the school, like uh, grade eight, let's say, and then grade nine, and then grade 10, something like that. Uh, because it seems like uh, it's going to be like unique cohort for every SNA, right? Mm -hmm. Is there like a possibility? Does it mean that it's going to show improvement over time? You know, uh, I, th I thought it might be something interesting. You know, I could hear from you folks. Thanks. For sure. That's a great question. And longitudinal evaluation has been something that we've been thinking about along with our international partners also doing this. Uh, the district in the beginning was not okay with a long-term commitment, so they didn't want to cooperate with, you know, tracking the students and, and giving us this information. But Philly's been so great with helping her team is now as they're triaging or discharging, actually, the students, they're asking for their consent to be followed up with um you know, up to five years after triage. And so now we're, we're working on rolling out an outcomes survey, actually with the 165 students now, I, I believe have been something like that, right? 168 served by upstream. Um, I'll have to look at the numbers again. It was, I think it was 168 last year. I think we're higher than that now. And we're going to be way more than that by the end of 2020, like March, 2024. So just with three implementations this year. Yeah, so now we'll be able to hopefully reach out to the students who were in the first cohort, so 2021. Now it's been a couple of years, so we'll at least be able to see, like it's not longitudinal, certainly not, but the first cohort now are in high school, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're in grade 11. Uh, so we've done some in-depth interviews with a couple of those students, uh, but this, I think the survey is going to really tell us a lot more. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for your amazing presentations. I have a question for the first group. Um, we talk a lot about, well, we have a key message that youth homelessness is different from adult homelessness. Um, so I guess, could you offer some additional key messages we could add to that? to that advocacy message, like maybe why shelters or, or supportive housing aren't the most appropriate uh, responses to youth homelessness um, in favor of what you're doing here. <laughs> sure, the, uh, that's a, a, a something of great importance to us is how and why do we have to consider youth differently. So um, there are a number of things there. Um, the traditional and still dominant approaches to addressing homelessness, I think have been developed with adults in mind, not the needs of developing adolescents and young adults. Um, and so we basically take the, you know, the shelter model, change the age mandate and have homelessness junior. So that's one thing, but there are some compelling reasons to put effort in there. Um, we, we spoke about the 40% of young people experiencing homelessness who had the first experience before they were 16. But in the 2018 point in time count, we asked them to include a question for everybody. How old were you when you first experienced mm -hmm. homelessness, regardless of your age? And 50% of the people surveyed indicated their first experience happened before they were 25, right? And they, uh, Reaching Home has produced this fantastic graph. It's my, my favorite graph of 2023, which plots the ages, right? And so what you see is the peak period for first time experience of homelessness overwhelmingly is between the ages of 12 and 20. And as mentioned, those who have that early experience are much more likely to transition to chronic, to chronic homelessness. And so um, 
If you believe that we need to address chronic homelessness, which Governor Canada does, um, wouldn't it be a good idea to work with people who are having their first experience when they're teenagers and develop supports focusing not just on are they housed or not, which is kind of the key performance indicator, mm -hmm. but focus on well-being, right? And so if we can help young people, like with the kind of approaches that you were talking about, Philly, uh, and help young people and their families, we'll have better outcomes for those youth if we can do that well. Um, we'll have better outcomes for communities, better outcomes for the families, but we'll also potentially have an impact on chronic homelessness. Right, so that those young, because we also know from research, um, and I, I'm more familiar with the youth home, youth homelessness side of this, but like any prolonged exposure to homelessness tends to have sometimes long lasting uh, negative impacts on young people. So if you're homeless for a year, your mental health worsens, you're more likely to have experienced trauma, you're more likely to be uh, nutritionally vulnerable, you're more likely to be victim of a crime even the way I frame people who are homeless as the, the people we should be afraid of. It's kind of the other way around. Um, and so the more, so, so our whole system that we've kind of locked into in Canada is built around waiting, right? So someone becomes homeless and we don't prioritize, like, how can we help you? Generally, we don't. There's, mm -hmm. How can we help you uh, not be homeless? Uh, it's like, you wait, because we've bought into this notion of, driven by the politics of scarcity, that if you want the, the gold ticket, housing first, mm -hmm. you have to be chronically homeless. You have to have complex uh, mental health and substance use disorders, right? And I'm not saying we shouldn't prioritize that group, but what it means is that we're, we're creating the very chronicity that we're trying to solve by not working harder to like, you know, target people when they first show up or ideally even before with things like upstream. So, so in addressing youth homelessness well, we actually have a big impact potentially on homelessness writ large. Because all those people who we're helping now, who are like 40, 50, 60, so many of them had their experience as a teenager and they didn't get the help they needed. So that was a long answer. I think it's longer than yours. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> Hi, my question is for Upstream Canada. I wanted to find out how you were able to get a buy-in from the school in the initial days of your program. So I work with an organization in Peel, and we focus on Black youth experience in homelessness. Now, we've found that some of the young people coming through our doors, that it, you're absolutely correct, the homelessness can be prevented. And so we initiated a program to work with the schools to support families and provide culturally sensitive counseling supports in the home to help to navigate mm -hmm. issues that may arise, that may lead the young person to leave the home. Uh, we're having a very slow buy-in from the school system itself around that program. And also what I find is that, you know, homelessness is hidden amongst a lot of youth in, um, in Peel and uh, some of the schools, they do not even see it as a problem mm -hmm. per se. So I just wanted to ask, like, what did you do to get such a big buy-in from the schools in Kelowna? Mm -hmm. And what advice can you give us? I mean, you've been yeah. studying it. Do you want to start? And I'm sure I can like, start because I think the critical piece was getting the district to buy in first. And when I first came on board, there was already sort of, a, you know, Sarah, so the, the director at the time w already had a relationship with somebody in the district who was a champion. And there was already this um, understanding that homelessness is a problem for the young people in, in schools. So that helped a lot, but there was a lot of resistance to uh, the opt out consent process. So, which is key to this whole model. And so we, there was a lot of back and forth between York University's ethics and school district ethics. And they were telling us we want university to review this, 
the risks first and then approve it and then we'll approve. But then our university was saying, we want the district to approve first and then we'll review it. And so there was a lot of back and forth with language and framing and all of this. And so uh, we, there, it was key that there was actually a champion in the district, but then unfortunately the champion retired. Uh, so then we had to find a new one and a new one was identified and she is such a great advocate of upstream because she understands the issues and she understands homelessness is a problem. And um, so they did work to identify moderate risk to middle schools that were moderate risk. Uh, and then from there, those schools kind of had to do it, <laughs> but it was seen as kind of like an opportunity for them <laughs> yeah. as well. They were resistant to it at first mm -hmm. for many reasons. We understand why schools are resistant to bringing on initiatives. And when I went there and I understood the issues, it makes a lot of sense. They had some very bad experiences with projects coming in and causing a lot of extra work for the educators. And apparently those projects became curse words, <laughs> associated with curse words because they were just too much. So typically when, when external organizations come in, they come in, they cause a big ruckus, they ask teachers to change things, and there's like a lot of work added for the school, and then they leave. There's no follow-up. And, you know, after those experiences, I think a lot of schools have just become jaded by that, and they don't want, and, you know, there's been a lot of tension right across Canada with educators feeling like they have so much on their plates. Uh, so there's all these different factors, right? Uh, political resistance, educators themselves, risk averse uh, climate. Uh, but yeah, how are we able to do it? I guess it takes a champion. It takes a lot of evidence being presented. It takes mm -hmm. people there seeing it as a problem, um, which they were able to do. And then, and, and then the right people, you know, being open to how can we address it in, in a positive way. And so upstream to them was seen as, as a great solution. And then in comes Philly and her team, um, you know, because the school folks, actually, the counselor and, and the principal were telling me they didn't want upstream after their bad experiences with other programs. But because of the way Philly and her team approached collaboration and really honoring the work that they're already doing, them as experts in their own rights, sitting down, comparing calendars, asking them what works for you and really demonstrating that they were there to help and to alleviate the social care burdens. A lot of these things set them up for success, but they really took it to another level. I don't know, Billy, if you have anything to add to that. Um, sure. Yeah, I mean, um, I came on in 2020, but that hard work of just getting it through to the Health Promoting Schools Committee and the Board of Education was already done for me by Jamie and uh, Sarah, which was wonderful. But we did use the evidence that was provided by our research team here. Um, and we like there's a couple pieces that I continue just to lock in and on to. Like Jackie was mentioning, like they were kind of forced to, but I, it was my job now to do the gentle invitation to be a part of although I knew that they didn't have just an invitation. <laughs> so we created like an impact letter, right? Talking kind of about what Geelong Australia or Geelong Project and Upstream Australia had been able to do and just say like, this is kind of what we're trying. We're just hoping, looking for some willingness. This is what we're up to, up to and we're gonna adapt it from the ground up using you and working on your time schedule. It was nothing but flexibility, adaptability. It was like nothing goes at my schedule, which is hard for me, right? It was like hurry up and wait all the time, right? I had zero control. It was very gentle reminders, gentle pushes, um, and then seeing what is black and white and where can we work in the gray. The stats that I always relied on and I continue to rely on when I engage new administrative staff for schools are the fact that our kiddos are experiencing homelessness for the first time before they're 16. That means they're in school. That means these are your kids, okay? We talk about the fact that 53% um, of youth experiencing homelessness across Canada have dropped out of school, but 74% of them say that they would return to school if they could, which means they're not leaving school for no reason. They want to be there. Something else is going on. What do we do to work together to keep them there? And then I normalize the situation. We talk less about homelessness and we just talk about the youth experience and we talk about the stat that also comes from our research where we know that 77.5% of kiddos experiencing homelessness said the key reason for leaving home was conflict 
across that between them and their parents. How normal is that? It's so freaking normal. And I know that we're gambling by investing our time, effort, and money into kids that may or may not ever experience homelessness or school disengagement, but is that a gamble? So that's the way that I approach it. And people seem to buy in. And then we had a launch um, and I, I used a video and we spoke with kids experiencing and who have experienced lived experience of homelessness, kids that I worked with directly. And we asked them a question, how would your life look if we stepped into or someone came and offered you support in a safe space when you were 12 or 13 years old? which is what Upstream is now doing. And they all st told their story from a different perspective. We had our kiddos who uh, came out of, as the part of the LGBTQ culture. We had kiddos who um, experienced or grew up with neurodivergence. We had kiddos who had a loss of a parent in their teen years. We had a kiddos who uh, grew up in a home with complex addiction and parents with complex addiction. All di very different stories, but everyone was a kid when they experienced <laughs> homelessness. And when the superintendent saw it, he said, these are our kids. So. It's about creating the content and having the background and having the evidence and like really playing at their heartstrings and saying we need to work together and we're not going to step on your toes to do it. And if I can just add, actually, it, it, it's hard to work with schools because of the risk aversion and knowing that I think help because uh, we know that they're worried about addressing youth homelessness for different reasons. And so reframing it collaboratively with school folks to say, you know, this is an initiative <laughs> that addresses extreme barriers to resiliency because that's something that's a priority for schools um, and and making them less afraid of the risks it was a big thing mm -hmm. i think we could talk about this all day but the uh the risk aversion is a thing and i think it i i kind of feel it's a cultural thing in canada in our education systems because when you talk to our colleagues in australia the school engagement wasn't really a problem and it's now been put in place in Wales and you said, how did you deal with the resistance of schools? And they're like, what do you mean? We explained it to the schools and the, they were like, hmm, this could be helpful. Let's go for it, right? And, and so that resistance is a big deal. I feel like when you're trying to get a public institution that doesn't see homelessness as their issue, you have to frame what you're trying to do in ways that make sense to the institution, right? So like, if we can provide these supports, you're gonna have greater attachment to education and uh, better outcomes in terms of uh, student performance. And then they're like, oh, we can get behind that. So, but it's a, it is a struggle. Any pilot we did, that was, you know, often the key thing that led to it to not work is the schools don't wanna be involved. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, my question is for the upstream team. Um, I was shocked by the 40% statistic. That is a significant statistic. And I guess my first question is, if you can share any insights as to why the definition of youth varies so much from sector to sector yeah. and just even within the youth shelter system. Like I've seen youth being defined as 13 to like 20, 16 to 24, but there just seems to be so much variation. And my second question is why Kelowna? Was that related to the statistic? And if there are any plans to implement this program in other cities within Canada as well? Yeah, we, we to answer the last uh, part first, um, we selected Kelowna because we'd had all these um, pilots that didn't work. We, we were wanting to start in communities that had certain characteristics, right? So do you have a culture of innovation? And Kelowna did. Do you have a youth homelessness strategy? Yes, they did. Do you have good collaboration between, um, you know, can any mental health association and boys and girls clubs in Kelowna? Yes. They also have this thing called the Foundry, which is an integrated youth service hub and so we felt that we were confident that they could pull this off. And so we worked with them and explained the challenges around school engagement. And so um, not only was it implemented there and the schools were engaged and the schools were on board, but the uh, implementation with 
people like Philly meant that the the uh, work proceeded in a way that was quite amazing. And so now that we have one and a half really good examples of upstream in Canada, um, we're now ready to like uh, entertain bringing more because I think we understand so much more about how to do it and what those key ingredients are. You know, and I, I think at the end of the day, if the staff are amazing and have the, the right values to do the work, you're going to turn around the schools, you're going to start changing people's lives, um, you know, and preventing homelessness. So, so yes, we're going to and we'll be uh, engaging communities um, and providing training and technical assistance if need be to help with that transition. So we went cautiously to develop this in Kelowna and I think that paid off, right? Like to have, to know that all the key ingredients are there. I'll, I'll just add that I remain cautious. Like we continue to expand and scale up within our communities, yes, right. let alone across the country. And there's still new ner like hurdles that we don't yet know where what they're going to look like and we still have to navigate those and this is a very like sensitive ship and i'm very careful about preventing like holes from being plucked into it um and it's just constant maintenance and looking ahead and maintenance and looking ahead and maintenance and looking ahead and working so um even starting too early in another community it might be detrimental to what upstream yeah. is really capable of doing as long as we, if we do it carefully. That's my you, piece on that. Yeah, and what you don't want is a failed experiment because then people will forever say, oh, we tried that here and it didn't work. We don't believe in it. So mm -hmm. it's you've got to really do what you can to make sure it goes well mm -hmm. and follows, you know, has, shows fidelity to the program. Mm -hmm. There was another question about the integration. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, can you repeat that part? Like the 40%? Yeah, uh, just the variation in how youth are defined. Like there's- some, Oh, yeah. well I think it goes to like challenges, you know, any age range is arbitrary, <laughs> right? Whatever it is. But youth is a, as a category is problematic because there are different cutoffs for different things. How old can you be to vote? Uh, you know, mental health services. Are you in the adult or the, child system, when can you uh, drop out of school, you know, like these are all arbitrary. And so, um, so we've created like our Canadian definition of youth homelessness to go from 13 to 24 because communities are ignoring the younger end, right? So you're right, like in some communities, youth homelessness is, you know, starts at 18 in some it's at 21 in many it's 16 and you know when you do that this is an interesting problem right so if you start have it at a high level then people start to believe there's no homelessness younger than that so in ireland their whole system starts at 18 and they're like there are people i know who are well-established researchers who say we don't have a youth homelessness problem. And I, mm -hmm. and I keep explaining that if you don't have infrastructure to deal with a problem, then it will seem invisible to you, mm -hmm. right? So if there's no, you know, so, so an example would be, if you have a hospital and you don't have a burn unit, your data might show that we don't deal with a lot of burns, except mm -hmm. in Emerge, right? So, so it's important. And so in Canada, we're dealing with, you know, like there's no, youth homelessness under 16 and then it's like to find out wow it's it's actually much bigger than we even imagine it's good you. thing you we have time for maybe one more quick question and then it's lunch for the last presenter um I was just wondering if there's any hypotheses or, or ideas around why s s some of the data presented the way it did. Um, I was especially interested in the low peer support uh, data, data point. 
Yeah. So our major hypothesis was like um, wanted to see if the protective factors like peer support and family support would actually protect the young people from the experience of interaction with the police, like being stopped by the police search and being issued a ticket. So that's what we wanted to see, because that's what we expect. Like, okay, young people who have like higher family and peer support would have like the sufficient capital, like social yeah. capital and family capital that would protect them from that. Thank you. All right, thank you once again to our presenters.